So this begins our study of World War II. Uh, we're going to begin with, uh, with this lecture as we try to work our way uh, towards the beginning of the fighting uh, with the rise of uh, fascist governments in Italy and in uh, Nazi Germany. So to recap, we, we talked about this at the end of our World War uh, I chapter. But remember that the Treaty of Versailles really doesn't bring the peace to end all peace uh, at the end of uh, wars that President Woodrow Wilson and the followers of the, the people, the leaders at, at Versailles really wanted. We see a lot of failures. One, we saw that the treaty itself caused anger and resentment in many countries. Um, Italy says it didn't get enough, even though it switched sides during the war. Japan's angry that it didn't get enough. Uh, countries are uh, upset that they weren't um, kind of granted some of the things that they thought they were fighting for. Germany specifically said the treaty isn't fair. Uh, they remember a clause 231 of the Treaty of Versailles blames Germany for starting the war. Uh, Germany was stripped of its overseas possessions, uh, lost border territories, Alsace and Lorraine to France, uh, the Polish corridor and, and territory to the new uh, Polish state. The Soviets remember with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk lost over a quarter of their territory uh, to uh, Germany. Uh, that territory was then turned over to create uh, new Baltic states like uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. Um, and so a lot of those states uh, come out of what Russia wanted and nobody informed the Soviets of this because the people at Versailles didn't really like the Soviet Union, nor was the Soviet Union really even invited. So they're, they're feeling pretty resentful. President Woodrow Wilson wanted to establish a whole bunch of democratic governments within Europe. However, even though he was successful in getting those democratic governments, these failed shortly after the war. The people in uh, Europe really had no, demo no democratic tradition. I mean, this goes all the way back to the Romans, where the people in Europe are, are, have been used to strong leaders taking over and, and kind of solving problems. And so that's what the people of Europe are going to kind of default to, are these leaders solving the problems for them. So the first place we see the uh, failures of Versailles rear its its head, and a the government's collapse is with Italy and the rise of fascism there. That's led by Benito Mussolini or Il Duce uh, or Il Duce, um, who goes in there, and that just means the, the leader. What we see after world as World War Two, I'm uh, sorry, World War One ends. Right as we move into the interwar period, uh, as World War One ends in Italy, we see lots of unemployment and inflation is producing a lot of bitter strikes. Some of these strikes are led by the communists, uh, particularly again, people are uh, uh, concerned about the threat of communism with the success of the communist revolution in Russia, and so there's calls for leadership as the Italian economy kind of crumbles and falls apart and people are paying more money and uh, people are looking for anybody to take over. So Mussolini is going to come in and he's going to appeal to Italy's wounded pride. He's going to say that Italians were successful. They are at the bargaining table at Versailles and the leaders let them down. They should have a lot more stuff in there and they should kind of look around and see that they're surrounded by all these Roman ruins. The Romans ruled most of the Western world. Uh, before and the Italians should do that again. And he really does a very good job of playing upon the fears of a complete and total economic collapse in Italy following World War I and upon people's fears of communism taking over Italy as well. So in 1921, Mussolini is going to establish the fascist party in the country and he's going to put forth his, his ideas and his views of what's called fascism. Now, fascists, whether they're in Italy or when it comes out of Italy and all the other, are going to stress an extreme form of nationalism. And so that's going to be the one of the things that's going to help ride the fascists to power following the end of World War I. Uh, they're going to stress an extreme nationalism. And they also want to place the interests of the state above those of the individuals. So this is the idea that your country is great. Why is it great? because all the people are kind of working together for a common goal. It doesn't matter how individuals, Mr. Cranmer's are doing, it matters how a country is doing uh, from there. And so what we see come out of fascism is the idea that really takes hold in several countries following uh, World War I, is that power needs to rest with a single strong leader. Only one person making quick 
decisive decisions all right can can solve a lot of the problems that are coming like unemployment like inflation right and they can then delegate a small amount of that power to devoted party members who then go and do it this is the idea that uh, a weakness of democracies is the idea that you're talking through this stuff and you're debating. Well, on one, that can be seen as a strength because you're reaching consensus and you come there. But it also can be seen as a weakness when people are out of a job and the economy is spiraling out of control. When you need quick, decisive decisions to be made, all right, they're going to affect lots of people. And that's what the fascists are using and are preying upon in this time of uh, economic uncertainty. So that's Mussolini. Uh, he's got a pretty checkered past. Uh, uh, up to this day, he's a, he's a failed newspaper uh, editor, uh, and he's going to kind of see this and, and, and rise up to there uh, in an earlier picture and eventually kind of take on this mantle of this person who's in charge and, and making decisions is going to lead Italy to greatness. So Mussolini is going to, uh, after a, about a year of founding his party, is then going to act, and he's going to, on uh, October of 1922 lead what he calls a march on Rome. Mussolini and his black shirts, and again, playing on national pride, you remember Garibaldi and his red shirts uh, from a century prior, the 1800s, and Mussolini kind of playing on more of Italian history. He, they're just going to march on Rome. And so basically with thousands of his followers in their kind of their fascist outfits that are, as you probably can figure out, black, are going to march uh, towards Rome uh, with the list of demands uh, and not so much forcefully take power, but to show kind of that the people support them and then that they need to be in charge, uh, given them that, and that's what it does. The Italian king, seeing that people kind of are appreciated of this and that he can use Mussolini as a scapegoat if it all fails, appoints Mussolini as the head of a new government, and he's now put in charge. Eventually, Mussolini is going to extend fascist control over every aspect of Italian life, and for the people of Italy, some good things are going to come out of that. Uh, Mussolini was said made the trains run on time you know, to be able to take a, a, a cheap and reliable public service and uh, make that better for there. Uh, he created jobs and public works programs for the people of Italy to go into, especially the countryside, and to drain a lot of swamps uh, to be able to get rid of, uh, to slow down the spread of malaria, which was really uh, causing a lot of problems for the peasantry of Italy. And so he's able to do that. Now, how is he able to make the trains run in time and be able to go and, and recruit people, conscript people to go drain the swamps by crushing any and all opposition and turning Italy into a totalitarian state like we saw uh, the Soviets doing uh, at the same time in Soviet Russia in a previous lecture? So that's what you're doing. So those are the trade-offs that you're going. You, on the one hand, you get trains that run on time. On the other hand, and, and you get uh, a job going and draining swamps to be able to feed your family, but you have any opposition land you uh, in, at best in prison and worse and other stuff from there. So that's what Mussolini's doing. Uh, so again, in October of 1922, uh, he's going and has his famous March on Rome, where he goes and leads his followers. Uh, uh, again, as he's in the, in the suit there, there, and then we'll show you a little clip, uh, a, a silent movie clip, because he's in the 20s, uh, of him going and uh, the black shirts on his March on Rome. So you kind of get the picture of what the, the march was uh, for there. Again, he's going to extend uh, fascist control over all aspects of Italian life. Uh, this is a big M for, as you probably can guess, Mussolini, uh, kind of showing uh, kind of like a, a military-esque Boy Scouts uh, from there in Penix from there. And this would be the fascist party headquarters that he built in 
uh, in Rome as well. Again, the CCCC, it's all that, remember, that's Italian for yes. So you get a big head of Mussolini's face, and will he make the trains one on time? Yes. Sorry, will he drain the swamps? Yes. Will he make Italy great again? Yes, yes. So again, you go to the fascists and they'll do all those things for you, but again, there's a trade off uh, for freedoms and stuff uh, along the way. So that's Italy. Uh, we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about Germany. Uh, Germany is going to come under the sway of a, another uh, kind of uh, leader who's going to believe in uh, fascism, and that's Adolf Hitler. We last left Adolf Hitler at the end of World War I lying in a hospital after suffering a severe gas attack in the final waning days of World War I, and he's pretty despondent. Um, upon hearing that his beloved uh, adopted company, country of Germany has lost the war and that they're quitting, and he's pretty upset about this. Now, Nazi propaganda, Nazi myth-making uh, during the 20s and 30s uh, says that this gas attack uh, altered his voice uh, and, and did something to his voice and gave it a mysterious, uh, mystical, ethereal quality to it that kind of helped explain why he was such a, a great public speaker. And again, that's Nazi propaganda for you. When the war is over, um, Hitler's the only job that he really can get to kind of uh, pay the bills uh, is be able to join back up with the army uh, to help the army spy on different political groups. And it's in the closing months, kind of in 1919, that he's assigned by the German army to stop in on a political party meeting of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the Nazis. Uh, in German, that's the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiter Party, or the NSDAP. Uh, and that's where he goes from there. Um, and, and so he's going and listening there, and he says, and he, when he's sitting there working on the auspices of the army, he's kind of like, oh, I, I like some of what these guys are doing. And he and he says that, hey, they kind of are, are on at least the right track. But he says these are a bunch of goofballs, and he can be the chief goofball. He can be the one who can run this party a lot better than the other people. And he sees that this is his path to be able to change the course of uh, Germany following uh, what he fails was the failure of the peace settlement of World War I. And so he's going to take over the party and completely change their political beliefs to his own solely but surely, uh, again, through kind of his organizational stuff. What makes him uh, effective, like we saw with other people, like a Mussolini, like a Lenin, uh, is he's a very powerful speaker and, again, more importantly, a, a very good organizer uh, to be in charge and being able to put people and recognizing uh, their strengths and their talents to get them uh, in up from there. So uh, to backtrack a little bit, there's a little baby Hitler, uh, again, growing up uh, from Austria. Uh, see if you can find, we'll play spot the Hitler uh, in, in this uh, elementary school picture. So we'll give you a second. Can you find him? Can you find him? Uh, yep, there he is uh, right up there, front and center. Uh, so, so that's what he's going to do. Uh, Hitler's going to grow up and he's going to go and, and join the army, uh, as we said. Uh, he, he's going to move from Austria in there. And really, Hitler's uh, he's kind of growing up uh, once he kind of moves out of his uh, under the auspices of his, of his parents, really kind of wants the, he's, his goal is to become a starving artist, right? To live the, that kind of bohemian lifestyle of going to operas and painting and being able to kind of be the starving artist, not be appreciated in his lifetime, but in generations to come, they'll be able to say the great name, painter Adolf Hitler, and then die a kind of obscure present-day death and be remembered. So this is some of his paintings and his watercolors that he did uh, in order to be able to be accepted into a art school of which he was rejected from. So again, you can have plenty of alternate histories for the course of the 20th century. If somebody just looks at this painting, which you know, it looks like it looks like a building. So look, and there's a fountain. It looks okay. And say, yep, that's art. He gets, he's got a purpose and will from there. So um, you can imagine our 20th century as Hitler the artist instead of Hitler the founder of the Nazi party. So he goes and he takes it over. And what are some of the things that he begins to uh, build upon? What are some of the basic beliefs of the Nazis? Is really taking old ideas that the German people have taken to heart. This idea of the stab in the back lesson that it was the Jews and the communists and these other people who literally stabbed the German soldiers in the back in their great spring offense of 1918, where they were in the, the suburbs of Paris, where they were so close to winning the war. The big fat cat bankers and industrialists and uh, Jews and communists right, all conspired against the brave German soldiers, right, including future Nazis, 
right, to take away uh, their uh, rightly earned victory. And, and so that kind of becomes the public belief that they're building upon, and the Nazis are going to take that idea and, and build off from there. Uh, what are the Nazis going to promise you? Well, again, if you know you're German, they're going to arbit, freight, and brot, right? Uh, work, freedom, and bread is, is what the the German Nazis are going to promise the German people uh, for you here in some of their early propaganda and stuff. So that's what they're going to go and, and do from there. And so they're going to build off uh, those early uh, kind of uh, ideas and, and take that and build it from there. There's Hitler's dog right down in the corner. Again, a very good public speaker. Uh, these are kind of pictures he didn't want released, but he spent a lot of time uh, practicing uh, his public speaking and particularly his ability to communicate information uh, while on the podium and, and on the stage to be able to uh, use his body uh, from there. Uh, people describe his speeches as him uh, kind of whipping himself up into a frenzy, uh, sweating and spitting and kind of working up into a big giant froth of emotions to be able to go and get us out there. We're going to play a small little clip of a one speech just to give you an idea of the public speaking that he was doing. Du, meine Arbeit für richtig hältst, ob du glaubst, dass ich fleißig gewesen bin, dass ich gearbeitet habe, dass ich mich in diesen Jahren für dich eingesetzt habe, dass ich anständig meine Zeit verwendet habe im Dienste meines Volkes. Gib du jetzt deine Stimme ab. So a little taste of kind of uh, what Hitler was going and doing. Now, the Nazis themselves cast a much wider net than the traditional and larger German political parties at the time, and they begin to get local attention in Bavaria, uh, in and around the, the, the southern city of, of Munich in, in, Ger in Germany. But the membership is always, is, remember, the, the Nazis are already a pretty small party as it is, and, and even especially at the beginning, the membership's going to be pretty small. Uh, Hitler had to take the course of when he's handing out the, the cards for people would put like, oh, you're member number 501 and member 502, when in actuality there wasn't any members like 1 through 400, just to give the idea of explaining their numbers. He's going to publicly condemn uh, communists and Jews. Uh, Hitler is going to denounce the Versailles Treaty, saying it's all wrong. Uh, Hitler is going to want to create a program to limit citizenship to people of just uh, German blood, whatever that is, which is kind of, again, contradictory for somebody who was born uh, in, in Austria as well. Uh, Hitler wanted to create well, one of my favorite words, uh, I, I create a Volksgemeinschaft, a people's community uh, 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 within Germany of everybody kind of working together for the common good uh, of, of a ethnic uh, kind of um, uh, similarities amongst everybody. As problems occur through Germany, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll circle back to this a little bit. Crisis in Germany during 1923 and 1924 are going to allow Hitler to seize upon those and pounce and act. In November, on November 8th of 1924, he's going to put into action what he calls his beer hall putsch. And this is his plan to uh, seize power in Bavaria, go into a local beer hall when the government's meeting, seize all the the heads of the government, right, have the people in Bavaria rally around him and then march from Bavaria to Berlin, just like what Mussolini did the year before. See, if you keep your timeline straight, you can see he's just basically copying Mussolini's plan. This plan is gonna is this plan's gonna fail. Uh, he's not expecting the government to send the army out to Munich to go to that. Um, Hitler's gonna be standing in front of a whole bunch of Nazis facing the guns of the uh, German army uh, kind of saying, hey, don't shoot on us. We're, 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 do, we're trying to do this for you. And then the army fires into the crowd. Uh, the guy to Hitler's left is shot. The guy to Hitler's right is shot. They fall down. A couple people die. We're going to be turned into martyrs from the Nazi cause. So again, another interesting one of serum situation. Um, and Hitler is then <laughs> captured and imprisoned and put on trial for treason because he's trying to overthrow the government from there. Hitler uses this trial though to gain national press and he's able to use the trial as a forum to gain a much wider um uh kind of uh press and more uh people uh looking at him and, and going from there uh he's able to kind of work with this and again there's lots of other problems going on in germany at this point and so he's gonna be sentenced to five years in jail for treason for trying to take over the the government uh but again circumstances are going to limit his sentence to just about a year uh in prison the beer hall putsch is just one of several uprisings that not, uh germany is going to face 
between the rise of Adolf Hitler and the uh, end of World War I. There's the Spartacus uh, uh, uprising as well. And there's a whole bunch of other people that are going from there. And Hitler is, again, trying to do this. So he's able to, uh, again, get uh, a small uh, following within Munich. Uh, he's able to seize the government, takes control. Uh, they have demonstrations. They're marching out there. They're going to go march on Rome like we saw earlier in the clip. Um, but again, the German army stopped them. There is Hitler standing in front. And again, their shots fired. People to the left are shot. People to the right are shot. And there was main uh, unscathed, but he's uh, arrested, imprisoned. And the Nazis uh, have restrictions taken upon them. The Nazis, uh, as a political party, aren't allowed to demonstrate anymore. They're not allowed to campaign. They're not, they even have their uniforms taken away. Uh, but again, the Nazis here are going to line up, and what this picture is showing that they can take away their uniforms, they can take away their shirts, but they're not going to take away their beliefs in Nazism, and they're still going to be able to go out from there. So Hitler's now in prison, and in prison he's going to write his book called Mein Kampf, or My Struggle in English. And what Mein Kampf does, it sets forth the basic beliefs of the Nazi party and his idea of Nazism. And Nazism is going to be the German brand of fascism. He's going to take what Mussolini is doing and then give him a, a German tinge along with some of his other goofball ideas as well. Nazism is violently anti-communist. Uh, you can put this in perspective of Germany just being uh, very close to Soviet communist uh, Russia. And the Nazis are going to be very much against them. They, he doesn't like it, uh, very upset about it, and that, that's going to be a, a huge factor in a lot of his decision-making going forward. The Nazis and Hitler believe in the idea of racial purification. It becomes the job of, quote-unquote, good races to get rid of, quote-unquote, bad races in order to create a, quote-unquote, perfect people. Uh, and so you're, uh, again, bastardizing the ideas of what Charles Darwin did, the natural selection, and, and taking those ideas and applying it incorrectly to humans and, and different races. And so, uh, again, trying to create his own uh, Nazi uh, supermen from there. Hitler also believes in this idea of what he calls more Lebensraum or more living space for Germany. The idea that the German people are better than everybody else in Europe, and so therefore their ideas and their culture should be able to spread at the expense of others, and they should be able to, if you're removing all these bad races in Europe, be allowed for uh, these Germans to kind of have more and more space from them. Uh, him and a couple of his leaders want to go and create move into Poland to create a kind of a German farmer frontier uh, fighters, uh, kind of like the, the pioneers of the uh, uh, American uh, West uh, from there. Uh, Hitler's going to be released in 1925, and shortly thereafter, he's going to legally refound the Nazis uh, with him in charge, even though they weren't allowed to do that uh, from his trial from there. We're going to kind of uh, take a little bit break from the Nazis here for a second. And throughout the 1920s, the Nazis are going to fail miserably at the polls. The party is lacking focus. Uh, they really are kind of taking the shotgun approach to solving the problems of Germany, uh, where instead, uh, and so they're trying to say, we're going to do all these different things. And people are saying, well, how are you going to do that? We say, well, I'm going to solve all these different problems. Well, how are you going to solve this one problem? We don't have any answers to that. So this is uh, Hitler in, in Lansdowne uh, prison. There he's going to write, write Mein Kampf uh, again while he's in pr prison. Uh, and again, uh, he's able to use this time and particularly his uh, uh, release to be able to go in and show that um, okay, to use this on a, on a larger scale. As you saw the New York Times uh, capture the, uh, capturing the, the moment when he leaves the prison and then moving on uh, from there. So if we circle back, uh, what's going to allow, what's the atmosphere that allows the Nazis to take over Germany is a lot of the problems itself that are evident within the German government. After World War I, uh, in the waning months of World War I, the Kaiser had abdicated, uh, he, he left, and a new government, the Weimar Republic, was established. This was a very unstable government. There's assassination and coups from many different sides, and there's over nine different cabinet changes from 1919 to 1923. Again, to give you an idea of just how chaotic this is, that's how it's a four-year time period, and a, a cabinet in, in this type of government, really, you have your prime minister and you have a couple of, of, of other uh, department heads, and they're kind of their own government. And so this would be like you have your Democrats and Republicans changing, like, the president of the United States and, and, and his, like, secretary of state and all the other stuff nine different times in a four-year period. And that's on top of all the assassination and coups. We showed you those 
people who uh, from Germany who signed the Treaty of Versailles, and as we said correctly, they're signing their own death sentences when they sign that treaty because uh, the people in Germany are going to be upset with them, and so they're going to assassinate them, and they're going to kill them. It's going to be a whole big giant mess within the German leadership from there. In 1923, France is going to be upset that they're not getting the uh, payments and reparations from Germany. Uh, if fast enough and so they go and they occupy the Rhineland in Germany uh, this is kind of the area between the Rhine River and the Ruhr River uh, in Germany it's the major industrial heart of the German center and France goes and occupies it takes it away from Germany to kind of hold it as as ransom for Germany to pay off for their stuff Germany also after World War One has the problem with all these former soldiers the army only can be a hundred thousand people maximum well, what do you do with all these soldiers who only know of being soldier? That's their skill. That's what they were trained to do. That that's what they have. They they can't go be a baker or or a, a candlestick maker or anything else like that. And so you have all these former soldiers who still have their guns, who still have their ammunition, who still have uh, their, this martial spirit, and they can't go fight for Germany like they've kind of been uh, brought up to believe. So they create their own different what are called Freikorps, right, to be able to go and fight communists in kind of big giant bloody battles in the streets and also kind of lending themselves to politicians trying to take over Germany in different spots and different places. The problems of World War One, in particular the peace treaty, is going to lead into 1923 to 1924 German hyperinflation. Again, remember your timeline. This is the crisis that's going to allow Hitler an act to put his beer hall push plan into place. But what this is, is that in order to pay for World War One, like in the war itself from 1914 to 1918, Germany's printed money. Um, so when they needed more guns, they need to be able to pay for those guns. They just printed more money. Right? And so that's how they're, they're going and as the, they're paying for U-boats and guns and artillery and gas and all that other stuff. So when it's time for the war reparations uh, build be to be due, right, they just said, well, we're just going to print more money. You know, well, how do governments raise money? Well, m usually smart governments just raise taxes. Here in Germany, though, the people are not used to paying high taxes. And so if a politician tried to raise taxes in order to be able to balance the budget, be able to pay for all this money going out, they just were voted out. So what was the, what was the message taken by the politicians in Germany? Just print more and more money, and if you don't raise taxes at all. Allies begin very shortly realizing that the Germans are just giving them more and more German dollar, German currency, that they're just roll, printing off the printing machines, that they demand their reparations in gold. So now all this gold begins to come out of Germany, and that's really the only thing where, if, again, you went to a bank, you could, in theory, give a whole bunch of paper money, and they give you a gold bar, or some gold dust, or gold coins in return. Well, all that gold now being sent out in the billions of dollars to the Allies, and the German government just kept printing more and more money. Well, this more and more money doesn't correspond to the gold anymore because it's not there. And this caused it to spiral out of control. And this is going to end up affecting pretty much every aspect of German life, as we'll show you some pictures. By the height of this hyperinflation in December of 1924, one U.S. dollar could, give, could buy you 4.2 trillion German marks. So, again, that 4.2 trillion mark number is is not very impressive because what does that buy you if i do one dollar worth of buying power and as you probably can imagine a, a dollar uh, today is not you can't do a whole lot with it so imagine again if it's going to cost you eight eight point four trillion marks in order to be able to go and do this uh, and so again that's this whole idea of supply and demand where if you have a, too much supply here paper money it's going to uh bring down demand from there so you have these groups of Freikorps going in this stage picture, trying to shoot this uh, communist with his trendy German haircut here. This is a stage picture, but again, gives you the idea of, of what's going on uh, in the streets as these non-stage pictures showing, I mean, they're, they're murdering people in the streets of communists or suspected communists. And communists and other groups and other Freikorps are, are fighting with machine guns and other stuff in the streets of Germany uh, as they're going and, and causing all sorts of problems from there. And this is without even any of the economics being in because you have all these German soldiers soldiers who have been taken out of the war, but they've got nowhere else to go, but kind of and unemployment is high, so they got nothing to do. So this is what's going on while hyperinflation is going as the German economy begins to print more and more money and it begins to be taken away from the marks and then begins to shoot up in the heights of the hyperinflation from there. 
So uh, you can just get some ideas. Uh, they were running out of bills, so they were putting on uh, uh, other stuff. Uh, what does it cost to mail a stamp? Well, at, at some points, 500,000, a million marks. Again, these are postage stamps um, to be able to mail stuff in letters. Uh, they started off with having pretty pretty pictures on, on some of these uh, bills. But again, when you start needing to covering trillions and billions of marks in order to be able to pay for trivial things, you can start to see the idea of, how fast and how they had to keep constantly changing for this stuff. Right? Four eggs cost 4,000 marks. Uh, what are some other stuff? One piece of bread here is going to cost 50,000. Uh, and so you're getting the idea of this is how much it's costing for other stuff. And people are needing baskets full of cash in order to be able to pay for this because that's how much money is stuff from there. Um, again, people are, are paying or going into grocery stores uh, with uh, just. Uh, again, grocery carts with cash to be able to pay for this. Uh, the grocery store owners or, or, or shops were taking to writing their prices in on chalkboards because the prices need to be changed there constantly. It got to the point where uh, workers were asking to be paid um, every single day or sometimes several times a day because if they would be the money they were paid when they arrived in the job, they could then go and buy. Uh, breakfast or some other groceries, but the money that they're paid with at the beginning of the day wouldn't be able to pay for goods at the end of the day because that's how fast the money uh, was spiraling out of control from there. So the question then becomes, if you have to pay for uh, a piece of bread, like right, right here, or right, one uh, piece of bread for one bread is a billion marks, well, what do you do with a single mark bill? Right? Those basically become worthless. Because uh, a billion th that is not even going to cover a piece of bread. And so, again, people would just throw them in the streets. Uh, they make uh, kites out of them. Uh, they were used uh, as um, decorations. And again, you can just can see the idea of you're gonna, this is how much money it's, it's costing to be able to buy simple things from there. Uh, kids would, were just given stacks of, again, of like five mark bills and one mark bill because, again, they, they were worthless at this point. And then you know, like, here's your Legos, go play with them. Uh, people would use them to decorate their houses. Uh, it was cheaper to use the paper money to light your stoves or to uh, heat your house with than it was to pay for coal with that money uh, because, again, uh, it, it's just going out of more and more out of control. On top of that, the German people um, are lacking food. Uh, they can't pay for all the stuff. They're not getting paid quick enough. Uh, parks and gardens throughout cities in Germany were turned over by the people and, and, turn, and be able to plant crops and potatoes and other stuff to be able to feed themselves because of how bad uh, this is going. And so it, this is the situation that Hitler is able to do this. Now, the United States is going to step in in the, in the mid-1920s with what's called the Dawes Plan, and they're going to help prop up the uh, – private sector of Germany with massive amounts of U.S. loans, and Germany's going to move to a new currency, the Reichsmark, right, to be able to stabilize the economy from there. That works well through the end of the 1920s, but then the Great Depression happens, and that becomes a worldwide Great Depression, and Germany is hit capital letter hard, hit hard by the economic collapse that begins in the United States. It sees a sharp drop in industrial production, a sharp increase in unemployment, and spiraling government debt as, again, the economy is still limping out of the hyperinflation of the early part of the 1920s. Hitler and the Nazis now come back into our story, and they take advantage of this economic collapse, and they campaign hard. Hitler introduces, it's Adolf Hitler, who's the first politician in the entire world to go on national speaking tours by airplane, to be able to speak in the south of Germany right, in the morning to one group, then fly to the north of Germany, speak to another group, fly to the west and speak to another, fly to the east and speak to another group, and be able to reach, have a national reach kind of for the first time from there instead of like some politicians are still doing in the United States uh, by, by train. He does airplanes. Hitler also has his own private army of stormtroopers or brown shirts, again, from their name, the SA, they'll beat up and intimidate political opponents. If you had smaller elections where you had a Nazi a candidate against a, another candidate, the other candidate would get up and speak, and then the stormtroopers would boo, and they heckle, and they go up and they punch people from there. Uh, the SA would stand outside of the voting boxes with kind of big giant billy clubs and say, hey, you better know who you're voting for, and look over people's sh shoulders as they're voting and then beat people up and intimidate uh, from there. The 
the political thing the Nazis do in the end of the 1920s as we move into the 1930s is they keep campaigning even without any elections. They keep this campaign uh, cycle going uh, from there. Think about uh, when you're watching, trying to watch Wheel of Fortune uh, in an election year, particularly in the uh, early March uh, here in Illinois, or in, particularly in this November, and you see all those different political ads. Well, imagine having all those political ads every single time you're going and doing that and all that other stuff. So that's what the Nazis are doing. And again, what allows Germany to kind of limp along for the rest of the 1920s is the Dawes Plan, where the United States is going to send billions of dollars in loans to help prop up Germany and to reinvest in Germany after the war. Well, the problem that becomes, this is a pretty good idea in theory, uh, loan money to Germany to help them out. But Germany needs cash on hand because they got billions of dollars of reparations to be able to go and pay. And so Germany just pretty much takes these loans and to the economic conditions that they're in and turns around and gives that to the Allies. Well, the Allies owe a heck of a lot of money to the United States. World War One is one of the great transfers of wealth from Europe to the United States from all the loans that Europe has to make uh, when they run out of money. So this money ends up just being all back in the United States. And if this cycle kind of works well for the 1924, but what happens in 1929 when the United States collapses and falls over with the stock market crash, well, then the whole thing kind of falls out from under them. Again, this is what's uh, the stage that Hitler's stepping in in order to be able to campaign here by airplane. Uh, he's going to be... Um, uh, moving and, and going from there, there is a couple stories of some pretty. Uh, it's, these are Hitler's birthday as he's getting some flowers there. Uh, some harrowing uh, landings that are kind of um, through lightning storms and through other stuff where they should have been flying, where he kind of is able to uh, survive. Uh, or again, another great what if ceremony if he, he goes and crashes in some of those different ones. By the fall of 1930, with the Nazis campaigning as hard as they possibly can, they're only getting. 18% of the German vote. So again, they're never really getting a majority here. As we move from 1930, just like how well you know from U.S. history, the Depression begins to worsen from 30 to 32. And so the government of Germany begins to rule by emergency decree, bypassing the Reichstag, the, the, the elected parliament of Germany. So the German people get used to being ruled by the people in charge making these decrees with kind of out consulting them without consulting their parliamentarians. In the spring 1932 election, the Nazis run their best and most effective campaign, but still they're only receiving 30% of the vote. This is the best election that they do, and still only 38% of the people of Germany are, are vote for them from there, and this is not enough. All right, what the Nazis want to try to do is take control and disband the Reichstag, the parliament, but they can't do that because, again, they're not getting even close to a majority of the votes at all or even – uh, something along close to 50%. So they're not able to do that. They are, though, causing a heck of a lot of problems in the political situation in all this other stuff. So in January of 1933, the German officials in the government say, hey, we've got nothing to lose here. Hitler is getting, and there's a lot of different political parties in Germany at this point. It's not like the United States with a two party system. The Nazis are getting uh, what well, looks to see some support, the Germans say, what do we have to lose here? Let's bring Hitler into the government. He's going to bring 38% or 30% of the vote with, with him uh, in support there. That's one out of every three Germans will support our moves. And the worst that can happen is he fails and he goes away and we don't have to deal with him anymore. And they believe that once they bring him into the government, he's going to have to compromise and moderate his views and they'll be able to kind of kind of control him as, as kind of a, a puppet from the figure. Let the people's uh, person go out there and speak what the people want to say, but in reality, he's going to have to work with the people in the government for there. So that goes well until the Nazis, once Hitler is chancellor, uh, have, have go and, and set the Reichstag on fire. The Nazis sneak into the parliament building of the Reichstag. They go and they light a whole bunch of fires. They set it on fire. And then as they're sneaking out of the building, they grab the first person they see, shoot him all right, without doing anything, and say, oh, here's the dead body. He was a communist. This is doing it. We need new elections because the communists are trying to overtake the government. The new elections after the Reichstag fire is enough for the Nazis then to be able to take over, and Hitler shortly then passes the Reichstag fire decree where he's saying, hey, look, the communists are trying to take over, and this basically ends all civil liberties within Germany. 
So the key thing to take away from, from the last slide here is that not all people support the Nazis. At the height of the Nazis' political power uh, before Hitler takes over, they only ever gained 38%. In fall elections in 32 and in 1933, they poll less than 38%, so they actually go down from there. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of people that don't like the Nazis um, in there. But the leader of Germany, Hindenburg, believe that he can bring this young whippersnapper Hitler into the government to be able to kind of control him and moderate his views. And so that's what they try to do as the Germans try to take over the, as the Nazis try to take over the Reichstag. They're able to do that when the Nazis sneak in and then set the Reichstag on fire. They then go in again, find a hapless person, go and shoot him and then blame him from there. So on March 21st of 1933, Hitler is then sworn in as, as chancellor. He calls for an enabling act to give him full powers to fight the communist threat right, to Germany because the communists are already trying to burn down the Reichstag. This would be like a group trying to burn down the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And at this point, this marks the end of the Weimar Republic. With Hitler as chancellor, uh, this begins the Third Reich era of what the Nazis call it within Germany. Very quickly, uh, we're going to see the Nazis uh, put their plans into effect. Uh, in April of 1933, less than a month, a couple weeks into this, the first concentration camp is set up in Germany uh, at Dachau. And this is mostly for uh, political prisoners and people who are uh, going against uh, early Hitler stuff. In May of 1933, there's a ban on all labor unions and associations because, again, uh, what they believe is ties to communism. By July of 1933, it's a ban on all other political parties. And so by within what? He's in March uh, 1933 is when he takes over. Within four months, all the political parties are, uh, you can only vote for the Nazis in elections. In June of 1934, this is known uh, in Nazi history as the Night of Long Knives, where Hitler has uh, grown concerned with several leaders of the SA who's been kind of working for him, and he has them secretly killed and murdered in, in kind of a, a cleaning house of uh, old Nazi leadership and uh, new associates and, and ones more closer to uh, Hitler are taken over. Uh, the Another group called the SS and uh, Hitler uses what he calls the, what eventually calls the Gestapo to create a police state within Germany where everybody's kind of spying uh, on each other. On August 2nd of 1934, Hitler is then elected as president and chancellor and this marks Hitler in complete and total control over uh, Germany. And so that's how he's able to kind of rise to power. Uh, he's able to become uh, the uh, Time Magazine's Man of the Year in, in 1933 uh, because of, again, what he perceived that the people are going to go and do for Germany um, to be able to kind of lead them out of their economic growth from there. And, and so he's able to kind of do this basically, uh, as we'll see, by stealing a whole lot of money from the German people. Um, but again, he, he does get a lot of support, and his people, as he begins to kind of uh, have these mass demonstrations and other stuff uh, from there, people kind of get caught up in this and go along at, as he does kind of seem to get from this. Uh, the SS and other groups are going to kind of play on this idea of mysticism and some like midnight ceremonies and uh, fires and stuff like that, uh, playing upon, again, aggressive nationalism and bringing Germany back to its former glory and a, a lot of parades and uh, programs and you can kind of see this and people kind of get caught up in this. Why do people go to uh, concerts when they can listen to the same songs in, in the radios, uh, in the radios and their their ear their earphones at home. It's again, this this kind of ability to be with a hundred thousand other people, right, going in and doing that, and, and Hitler becomes kind of this person that he, people let even the little kids hang out with, and go from there. And so so that's uh, kind of Hitler here joking over some tea, as again he becomes the power in Germany, and that. Uh, also allows him to put forth his ideas uh, and said that there's also problems with parts of Germany. And so they, we have book burnings and other stuff as he begins to put in his uh, kind of uh, evil uh, ideas. And we'll see how he does that later on um, in another lecture.